Hello, BookTube. I mentioned the other day that uh, I'm trying to make an earnest effort to revive uh, regular features on this channel. I love doing them, but it, when they fall out, it's hard to get the momentum back up again. Uh, and no regular feature on this channel has more adherence than last week in BookTube. Uh, so I'm going to try and ease my way back into that starting today. Uh, and I have, uh, I have uh, some things that I saw on BookTube in the, roughly the last week uh, here on the on the MacBook that I wanted to bring to your attention. You, you know, the, it's not comprehensive by any means. I watch a lot of BookTube. I'm sure the rest of you do as well. Uh, it's just some of these things stuck out for one reason or another. I wanted to make sure that I brought them to your attention uh, in case you missed them, in case you were interested in looking at them. And I will leave all of the links down below. Uh, and the, <laughs> the first thing I wanted to start with is a little self-serving. Uh, it's an event. It was all over your BookTube. It's March Mystery Madness the third year of March Mystery Madness, uh, in which for the entire month of March, a whole bunch of booktubers will, will encourage everybody else on booktube to celebrate murder mysteries and the reading of them and the loving of them. And the reason why it comes first on my list is because it's the very first time anyone's ever asked me to help host an event. I am one of the hosts for 2018's March Mystery Madness, so we're making a lot of mystery-related videos in March. Uh, but also, we had an event <laughs> we had an event on BookTube. We had a BookTube, a BookTuber, uh, get published. Rachel Morrow got a story published in an anthology and had it was present as one of the authors signing copies at an event in the legendary bookstore in Washington D.C. Politics and Prose, <laughs> and she was met there uh, by Ernestly Eston and Peg, the book prize addict. They they had a, a sort of a mini BookTube meetup. Uh, and did videos, and it was it, it seemed utterly delightful. Uh, so congratulations to Rachel. <laughs> uh, but then uh, the next three things I want to mention were part of a trend that I noticed all over BookTube, a very welcome trend, uh, of BookTubers just getting in front of camera and sort of talking about about books, yes, mostly, but also about other things, without any kind of feeling that that was wrong. Without, uh, it's a thing that's cropped up on BookTube before, where you know the where in reality most of us watch each other's channels for the people involved, not for the books, not for the updates, but for the to check in with the people, and that if that's true, then acknowledging that books are our first love and that we always want to talk books with each other. It, it stands to reason that we would be interested in, in everything about each other. <laughs> and what, and basically, what you did with your day. <laughs> and I noticed a few videos last week uh, that simply unadornedly did that. Uh, my favorite one, <laughs> my favorite one was on SFF 180. I'm assuming you all subscribe to Thomas's channel. He is the place to go in science, for science fiction and fantasy on BookTube. Uh, and he did a video, very unlike, he, he usually has the studio and the lights and the background and whatnot. He did a video one might almost say a Steve-ish video of him just sitting on his couch. Uh, and it, they had a great title. It's called Thomas Has a Very Chill Week. Uh, and he, of course, it's a, it's a big week for him and for the, the fellow hosts of the SFF uh, BookTube Awards. The BookTube SFF Awards have announced their shortlist. So that's a big deal. But for his, you know, sort of a weekly check-in video, he basically just sat there and, and talked about, uh, you know, a... Uh, an old science fiction uh, Samuel Delaney book, Empire Star, that he found in a box, and a bunch of other things that just came to his mind. And there was something very relaxing about it just being a video. Without you know, Ordinarily, his videos are incredibly professional looking. This one was just him talking to the camera. And he wasn't the only one. Uh, Max at Well Done Books, who's been making tentative steps to return to BookTube. T steps that should be applauded. <laughs> he did a thing called uh, Watch, Read, Listen. Where instead of doing a weekly roundup of just books, he does a weekly roundup of basically the art that he has consumed. The, the, the stuff that has been attracting his attention and it works really well. It's not, uh, it's not every booktuber or it's not every YouTuber who could do that, who could just sit there and talk with free flowing enthusiasm about a whole bunch of different types of art, but he did it just fine. <laughs> and I think a large part of what made it work was that we like in so many other cases, as I mentioned, we go to the channel for the person. Uh, and same thing with uh, Jack, the bibliophile. Uh, who, who instead of doing an am reading or, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
Friday reads or a wrap up or anything like that. He just did a much more free flowing conversation about stuff on his reading radar, and it was it worked really well. <laughs> Those kind of videos work really well. I, I think uh, I understand that BookTube in its infancy probably gained a lot by the rigidity of the structures, you know, Friday reads, monthly wrap-ups, monthly TBRs, that sort of thing. But I think as BookTube gets older, and as, you know, to put it colloquially, as all of us get to know each other, I think we, I think you're probably going to see videos like these more often, people just getting in front of the camera and talking, just catching you up. I don't think the formalized stuff will ever go anywhere. The formalized stuff is too much fun uh, to do, but... Uh, I like seeing these. I like seeing people just just turn the camera on and talk about stuff that they've been not necessarily just reading, but just anything. And I saw a lot. These are the three that I'm mentioning here, but I saw a lot of videos of booktubers saying, hey, I just saw a movie, or hey, I just caught up on this series on Netflix. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, then uh, I also love, in last week in booktube, I love to mention book reviews. Uh, just because I'm a book reviewer, so I pay attention to them, even though they seem to be the ugly stepsister as far as booktube videos are concerned. And I understand that. I, I do understand that. If you, if you, your title on your video and your thumbnail and whatnot announces that you're reviewing one book, it's understandable that maybe two-thirds of the people who look at that video might think, I only have so many minutes in the day to watch videos, and I have no interest in that book at all. It, that's not the same thing as a generalized conversation, where you come, you're there for the person. You can be there for the person all you like, but if the person is talking for ten whole minutes about one book that you're not going to read and have no interest in, no matter how much you like the person, you might give it a pass. <laughs> uh, but uh, there were two videos, that, two, two reviews that I wanted to mention. Uh, there were a lot of good videos, a lot of good reviews that I saw. But uh, uh, James, I plot some points, reviewed uh, Last Night in Montreal by Emily St. John Mandel. And... <laughs> And uh, he rather endearingly called it the best novel he's ever read. <laughs> but even so, his enthusiasm was was extremely charming, extremely enjoyable. <laughs> uh, and also, because Emily St. John Mandel had a great week, Sam at Thoughts on Tomes reviewed Station Eleven, her her only passable novel. <laughs> and... Uh, and those, watching the two of them together was really nice. Uh, and then there were there were. Uh, I want to end with a small pod of just miscellaneous stuff, starting with Jason Purcell, uh, who who uh, did a video on his collection of signed books. And uh, Jason is a is a a bit of a poobah in the can lit scene. Now, although he is very modest, I think. Uh, I think there are a lot of authors on the Canlit scene who are very happy that he's there and championing their work. And I think that's only going to get more pronounced. I'd be willing to bet that if, that if all goes well and the United States doesn't nuke the world, I'd be willing to bet that in 20 years his name will be synonymous with Canlit. Uh, it'd be nice if he'd write a book. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but because he's in a position where he's meeting and introducing and talking, interviewing authors all the time. He has a large signed book collection, so it was fun to watch to, to watch him go through a bit of it. Uh, and then uh, Jenna Maresi, who I think we can fairly dub the queen of AuthorTube, a self-published author who does great author-related videos on BookTube. They're just fantastic. And she did one uh, this week on... ARC reviewers on recruiting them if you're a self-published author. What they are, why it's important to get those reviews out for Amazon and Goodreads, and also what it is. And I thought it was fascinating. It's a whole world that I know almost nothing about. Uh, which you, you might think at first blush is a little strange, since I, I know the reviewing world really well. Probably better than anybody currently alive. Uh, but this is a whole new reviewing world. This is for the people who are doing it all themselves. They're they're publishing their own novel and they're get they're essentially generating their own word of mouth and their own press. Under the you know the pitiless but accurate assumption that a self published book is never going to get reviewed in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Christian Science Monitor or the Washington Post or anything like that. So you have to do it all yourself. You have to do everything yourself. Uh, I love Jenna Maresi's videos. I love it when she looks straight into the camera and says, the one-star reviews are going to happen. <laughs> so she's, she's 
the the no nonsense older sister that every aspiring self self published author really needs <laughs> to encourage them, but also to just take the doilies off everything. <laughs> uh, but uh, and of course, I've had a lot of people uh, in over the course of two years email me about ARC reviewing, and the reason why I don't do it is contained right there in Jenna's video. She she uh, she says it outright that. The whole, the whole point of an ARC review, good or bad, is to help publicize your book. That's the arrangement. Uh, and that's not what a real... Re that's not a, what a, a reviewer does. A reviewer has no interest whatsoever in the publicity of a book. Uh, so this is a totally different thing. It's a, it, it might have the word review in it, but it's a totally different thing. It's a different kind of partnership between the author and people who may not even praise the book but who are still invested in getting its word out. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. It's a whole world that I need to study. I need to learn more about it, especially since there may come a day when I when I join that world, when I want to give it a try. I've been very curious. <laughs> uh, but there, uh, let's see here. Oh, yes, of course. We can't, we can't do Last Week in BookTube without mentioning vicious anti-Steve campaigns, now can we? <laughs> this time, in the form of the anti-Steve read-along being done by Lukash at Lukash's Books and Elena Macrodina, who are reading The Silmarillion, and you might think that reading The Silmarillion a few chapters at a time is their main point, but no. No. Their main point is to exclude Steve, who was not invited to join, has not, invited to, has not been invited to join in progress, because I guess I'm Morgoth. And... I'm 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 fast behind my walls at Angban. I'm the ultimate evil. I would I would sully their little read along, which is almost done. They read together a, a public body read of the Silmarillion, and I was not invited. <sighs> uh, but there, are, there are two things I want to end with here. The two the two highlights of my of my uh, my booktube this week. One is recent, and one is a few days ago. Uh, and I want to start with the recent one, which is Eric Carl Anderson, that well-known troublemaker, <laughs> Eric Carl Anderson, who uh, has for years been been writing an indispensable literary blog called The Lonesome Reader, and who now has an equally indispensable booktube channel. Uh, and he made a video in which he predicts that Sight by Jesse Greenglass, her debut novel, is going to win the Booker. Now, he had it was partially tongue-in-cheek. He knows perfectly well. He knows better than most people how crowded that field is going to be before the long list is announced in July. Uh, but the novel really impressed him and gave him a whole bunch of thoughts about, you know, the different factors that are involved in calling the Booker long list, male versus female authors, American versus versus UK for th debut versus experience, short versus long, all that kind of stuff. He, uh, it was just a fascinating discussion to see him weigh the variables, and of course I thought about it uh, directly because I the uh, I read uh, the book and and I, of course I don't agree. <laughs> there he's a uh, it's it's a it's a debut novel about a young woman who is facing motherhood and her uh, enthusiasm and her anxiety. She's sort of channeling into into studying the stories, the biographical stories of of actual historical figures. Uh, and in his appreciation for the book, Eric says that those parts flow seamlessly into the present day narrative. And I thought that was the weak spot of the book. I thought they didn't. <laughs> I thought they seemed almost all of them, with one exception, uh, uh, almost all of those historical segments seemed sort of woodenly grafted on to the story. Uh, I could, but but when I was listening to him uh, talk about the book, I was reminded of something that I don't like being reminded of. But nevertheless, since I was reminded of, I will remind you of it, which is that when it comes to assessing contemporary fiction, Eric is considerably better at it than I am. <laughs> uh, he he. Uh, <laughs> he might be right. He might certainly be right that the book will be on the long list. Uh, the one factor that he wasn't paying any attention to in his video, uh, which is actually kind of charming, but come on, the rest of us have to pay attention to it, which is that 
which is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that uh, to observe a thing is to change it. Well, that's that's never stronger than in the case of someone like the Lonesome Reader. <laughs> and the reason why is because I know for a fact that three of the five 2018 judges for the Man Booker read the Lonesome Reader. They read the blog. And I know that at least one of those three watches his channel religiously. <laughs> they take his opinion seriously because he's one of those kinds of con of contemporary fiction readers where, you know, if something really strikes him, even other experienced readers are going to go and say, ah, oh, there might be something to that. I think the word is influencer. <laughs> so, so in a way, it's not fair for him to make a video saying this incredible long shot is an incredible long shot when he's when the word that he has said that is going to get to the judges. <laughs> he's going to get to the people who make the long list. <laughs> I think to an extent that he himself would probably downplay, he has probably just influenced the long list to make sure that this book gets on it, which is kind of amazing <laughs> in a way. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But I would be willing to make a bet, you know, that 35 years from now, 40 years from now, when people's, when confidentiality is, is no longer apl applies and people are writing memoirs, I'd be willing to bet that in the footnotes of a couple of those, a, di a few different judges will say, yeah, we didn't even know about the book until he made his video. And then we read it and it was kind of good, certainly good enough to be on the long list. I wouldn't be surprised if that was true. <laughs> That's kind of unfair. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the last thing, the last video that, that, that I wanted to mention before I let you go, uh, was David at the Poptimist, who did a video, <laughs> I've, been, I've watched it a few times now, uh, called You Suck at Reading. <laughs> In which, judging from the comments that uh, to, on, the, to, on the video, he in which he talks about things that apparently are almost universal among readers. What about about not remembering what you read? About increasingly uh, the, about the 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 way that people in twenty first century export their memory functions to external sources. So you you no longer do the 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 mental process of remembering. Um, I don't even know how rainy a place Khartoum is, or or. Oh, the, the you know the the, uh, the names of the Vedic Eddas or whatever you don't you no longer make a mental effort to remember those things because you know exactly where you can find the information without storing it in your own mind. And uh, the, his video, in large part, was about how people increasingly do that with books, with the content of books. Uh, one one amazing moment in his in, it's a great video. All of his videos are great, but in, one amazing moment for me anyway in his videos where he said that he went to his bookshelf pulled down a book and remembered exactly who recommended it to him under exactly what circumstances and what method they used to recommend it to him. But remembers almost nothing about the book itself. <laughs> so so I, I watched his video the first time completely non-comprehending anything about it. And then I, I've watched it two or three times since then and I honestly don't... The, the, the phenomenon at the heart of it I honestly don't understand. I don't understand how you could simply forget something that you read if you don't have, uh, you know, some sort of neurological problem. <laughs> but according to... Uh, uh, the gist of his video was that that is normal, that the way people remember things is changing, thanks to the fact that we are now, all of us, surrounded at all times by instantaneous factual answers to any question conceivable. So that, uh, I guess, by implication, it's no longer necessary for us to carry around so much factual information, because we don't we can offload it. Uh, I th I thought that whole thing was fascinating. It's it's a, it's a classic Poptimist video in that it leaves you thinking about a lot of things long after you've watched it. Uh, so I urge you to watch it. <laughs> I actually urge you to watch all of these. They're all they're all terrific. Uh, and to let me know in the comments field not only what you think of these videos. Uh, but what I missed, what, do, what, what did you see that's not on this list that I may not have seen myself? That's, that's the flip side of this coin. Absolutely. Is that I want to know your last week in book two. Uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll wrap this up for now. We'll see if this is still popular and if so, I'll do it again. Uh, and I will see you soon. We'll be back to other videos. <laughs> Thank you, book two.